I'm right now the co-founder and CEO of Dragon Ball, which is a tool for product managers and your teams. And I, the reason I started, a lot of startup founders are similar in that you have a problem, is it bugging you for so long? So finally you say, okay, nobody's fixing it, I'm fixing it. And I started Dragon Ball the same way because I've been running, you know, as you can see, uh, product management for several companies, the big and small, and I realized that we we still using freaking spreadsheets to manage our roadmaps. And uh, so, um, so when someone came to me, actually within a month of each other, two person come to me that I used to work with. They are so they are actually on the engineering side. Say, Becky, what do I do? How do we assign people and the project and resources? Um, you know, we can't afford to hire someone like you, but uh, is there a tool? I said, well, you know, I've been looking for a tool my whole career. Uh, he said, well, if you don't have a tool, can I use it? your spreadsheets? I said, okay. So I guess I have to make my spreadsheets available. So then I started Dragon Ball. Uh, anyway, uh, building product is my passion, and especially working with the product management team. So I'm kind of like in the interact section of product engineering and program management. So that made uh, my tool a little bit unique, and hopefully, this one will help you. Um, so this this chat will help you be um, a PM having a little bit more um, touch with your engineering and maybe even program management side of things because we kind of touch all of that in, in the section. So um, so today um, I'm going to quickly jump through. Um, I think you're very familiar. That's you know many of us like that, right? Uh, there's engineering and there's a business. That's changing all the time, and it's a completely different dimension. And this one is like, go, 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 tell me what to do, feed the beast. Um, so, you know, 80% of teams struggle with comp competing priorities. We're gonna talk about that. Um, and then your team, even with all the effort you do, you still feel like, I don't know what's the strategy. And then, you know, finally, most of the companies, so in 5,000 companies, after three years, they will fail. Uh, to scale, not fail, fail, but fail to scale. So they would, some of them will sell below the, the price they were a few years ago, and many of them just go away. Why? Because the scaling, which a lot of times the PMs have to hold it together, is very challenging. So, um, and that's, that's the things we have to deal with. It's, it's, it's an endless list of to-dos. And, and, and that is why we have to change how we do things. So it's very dry look at us, by the way. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more. That's the difference when you have things you can't Google it, you can't read everything. But it is very dry to look at the two diamonds, think about, OK, everyone knows there's a strategy, there's the execution, you get the market together. What's the big deal? It is a big deal in that in many companies, these two steps are separate. So there's a disconnect. But in companies, they do it together, and they're not doing together as two steps. They do it together like this. So everything's a model together, and and that's where you know you know startup companies, even startup companies, what they need to do is to separate those two but connect them. And how is the market here? The market there. What's the differences? The market here is like. I have a product, I release it to the market, customer have feedback, so there, there's something I improve on, the surveys and the forums and all the stuff coming, it's very tangible. Most companies don't see that is the trend that's coming, that this is not telling you. And that's where things pull you under the rug, saying, oh, realize that something's, it's more fundamental and changing, and we're not seeing that. So the idea is that this two both are important, happen in different cycle, and that will drive your decision in terms of goal setting, in terms of strategy setting, and in terms of how you build your product roadmap. Product roadmap is not backlog, because your backlog gets thrown away every month, every quarter. Right? Roadmap actually changes all the time because the market is different. Your competitor is different. The customer response to your product is different. So with that said, um, Let's talk a little bit about different roles. You know, uh, some of you here probably already play one or two or three of the roles at the same time, or maybe separate time. Now we know executives; they their strategic cycle, the top dash ones, are longer time points. So we talk about years, multi quarter at least, right? So their execution cycle 
the tangible to do's is actually on a quarterly basis. Where at the you know the PMs are working the closest to the team, their strategic cycle is actually talking about maybe a quarter or maybe several months, and then the day to day is actually weeks. So what does this mean? Is that the strategic cycle and execution cycle uh, varies depend on the level of operating inside a company, and they have a different time horizon. Therefore, when we connect them together, we need to connect them both at the same level and the cross level. What are the things that we do? Where, by the way, um, you don't need to be an executive to think about that, because for every individual PM, you know, one is your, you can think about your executive for your product area. The other part to think about is your success and the future growth is to understand what's the thinking and the needs up there. They're your customers, right? So, uh, so the goal is that when there's top-down goals, OKRs and stuff in the company, the bottoms-up goals need to match. If they don't, they go sideways, right? So the success won't happen. Not only success not happen for the company itself, uh, you know, personally, it's also misaligned. And then the so the part of that is you know where individual PMs roles and bottoms up roles happens where you make a lot of impact down here is to realize the operating part of the the product or features are not moving the needles, and that it become think about the, the diamond earlier so that's the input into the strategy cycle how that will impact your diamond that will change your goals well goals change everything of your of your product roadmap. Um, so, so that's where the concept of responsive PPM or responsive roadmap in, in coming to place, where we really think about all the factors on our roadmap in three ways that's a little bit different from what we do today. Similar, slightly different. One is the multi-factor evaluation. We're going to cover that in a little bit. And the portfolio approach, there's a lot going to talk about it, because it's a very unique. Most people say, hey, I'm just an individual PM. I don't have a portfolio. Wait. Uh, and then more, which is um, resource contention, competing demands, as well as how it is different today in terms of how the world works and the measurement of successive products is so different from the past. You know, some of you work in a bigger company, you probably know, okay, we're gonna have a strategic planning, we have put this to like an ROI analysis or an, you know, IRR and, or whatever. But that is so far away from what we actually build our product. We talk about resources and we talk about metrics. So this is a new way to really think about how do we drive contention, how do we prioritize. Um, so using an example, it's a real roadmap, I mass some of the stuff. So most of the people are very familiar with the prioritization mechanism, you know, scores and rise and all that stuff, right? So here is your scores, here are your resources, and then we run out of resources, right? It's stuff, prioritized. Um, what happened? is that when you talk to your stakeholders, say, oh, this is this score and that score, they're like, what is the score? Even for myself, I was debating on a score with the people for like many meetings, and I couldn't really explain. I forgot what it was, because you know, we were looking at all that kind of convoluted data. So what we try to do, what we try to do is we try to flatten the score, make it more bespoke. Why? Because, uh, by the way, I'll share this slide so you can have all of them. And so why we want to, uh, why, why was the score coming to the first place? Because the human brain could not process more than seven. Well, they say seven, some later on they say actually four. Multiple factors at once. So we simplify, we make a decision, we put a score and they say that's the decision. But if we have a tool or a way to actually see the, the, the formula going to the score, you realize, uh, I'm going to oversimplify this, but it could be other things, right? So there's a customer segments, for example. These are the features that benefit, will primarily benefit. As you put these things together, say, well, we didn't do anything of this, so our channel partners guy will be not very happy about. And we'll realize that we're not uh, in investing anything on acquisition. So that's why multi-factor uh, participation framework is important in that we can actually see that. And is it okay not to have it? So, um, so this is one um, one side of um, one side of the first one is multi multi factor uh, prioritization. I want to just use a a small case study um, happened in PayPal. So I joined PayPal. I was very lucky to join PayPal at the right time. It was pretty early, two thousand 
for um, the time that PayPal was only in five countries and they realized that international expansion is a huge opportunity for PayPal. So we were only in five countries. So those five countries were very, very successful. So all of the country manager who are basically like the GMs, so you think about Uber models, some of them, right? So they have the country GMs. They would say, hey, launch our country, launch our country, right? And there are so many factors to be considered. Obviously, the size of the country, right? Uh, what people don't realize is that there's also the revenue versus cost. So PayPal is a very thin margin business. So if you go to a country without a lot of the deeper engagement, that PayPal will be losing money. And that's like a, such a high capital intensive business, it will be challenging. And then there's a portfolio impact because PayPal was still part of eBay. And then you move a little needle on eBay, we're talking about the millions, the hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And then the other dimension that most people don't think about, and again, I think it, you know, for PMs being here for a while would know, okay, so engineering resource actually is a very big part of prioritization, right? So not only engineering resources as a days or weeks, also different teams because sometimes you have a surplus in certain teams and a bottleneck in the other. So these are the factors we're considering. And you know, think about all this country managed flow over here and then kind of pounding our doors and, and lobbying for their countries. And what do we do? So we lay all these factors together. We end up deciding to launch a much smaller country, which is Hong Kong. So Australia was no brainer because Australia was like the next biggest market. But there are a lot of countries bigger than Hong Kong. Why we launched Hong Kong? Because of other factors, other factors like a portfolio, other factors that strategic impact that have opened up a completely new business. And also other factors in terms of resourcing. Because the launching itself is a completely different team versus some of the financial products, which is another team. So we were able to kind of stagger them and, and you know, Australia didn't get so much delay by putting Hong Kong in that we drove a lot of value in terms of launching Hong Kong. So by the way, all this country launches. Uh, so PayPal, um, 45 of the business came from the US, but 55% of the profit come from international because they're highly profitable by doing FX changes and other things. But the decision main thing is to think about beyond just one factor. So the prioritization score would never really allow us to make this kind of decision. So the other part is a portfolio approach. Um, a lot of a lot of PMs say, even even like ahead of the PM will say, well, we're a small company, we only have one product line, we don't have a portfolio. But the the idea is this: you step back and think about it on the first principle basis that portfolio is not product line. Portfolio is a different types of opportunities you could potentially invest in. And when you think about that, you see, realize, hey, we could have a portfolio goals. They're competing with you on different goals. Where should we invest? How much we should invest? The chances are that evolves, right? And you know, we'll go to very back. In the early days, you want an acquisition. So you get a lot of acquisition. And the next thing you know, the, the, the bottom line happens at a conversion because you're not convert, so you will not converge. And then you know the next one will be the retention, right? So I mean, all these actually changes. So how much you invest in different goals over different period of time is really driven by your business. But if we don't think about that, prioritization and the goals are two different words so that we want to tie them together. Obviously, we have the segments, new and existing. And I was joking, even this morning, talking to the tech star uh, startup, folks, they're like, oh, as soon as we have first customer, everything changed. Because then you have to decide how much I'm going to work on feature set for this B2B customer, this large enterprise. They have all these features and ask how much I have to build so that I can go to other customers. Right? So these are the allocation we have to think about. And then the last one for people working in a bigger company, you know, you may or may not have a lot of control on that, but I would almost say you should consider your own roadmap and its own engineering teams. And when you negotiate with other PMs, take this route will give you more leverage and also rational on what kind of common goal we're trying to move, for example. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, talk a little bit about your career, right? So there is a very good saying, say managers, so individuals manage projects. Right, but you know, when you go to managers and directors, you actually, so managers manage programs and directors and above manage portfolios. And that's where, you know, having this kind of mindset, it will help you to speak the same language and also grow into an executive level sort of thinking, right? Um, 
So if you work in a bigger company, and, or if you own a bigger part of your roadmap, think about how much you allocate to risky stuff, innovation, versus how much you do optimization. Because quite often, PMs get pushed a lot to, to do all the things that people want to do. The support wants you to do something, sales wants you to do something. And if you don't protect your risk allocation, the future of the product is very questionable. Um, so I'm going to use another example, also PayPal example. Um, 2003, PayPal account for less than 3% of SMB payments. And 2003, PayPal had 80% or more of the, uh, the, the business coming from eBay. And there's a one single PM, per, uh, PayPal Merchant Services, and realized that all the stuff we built for eBay, merchant on eBay, can be used for merchant not selling on eBay. And you know, you can realistically think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in those merchants not selling on eBay. But obviously, what you compete against is one, uh, a like single, like for like an output to output, right? If I put a two weeks of dev day, I can generate millions of dollars of benefits for the business. Right? If I put it in here, who knows where it's going? That's one. Two is if you build something that's good for merchant not selling on eBay, you cannibalize the eBay business because the merchant will not be so you know, excited to sell on eBay because they could sell somewhere else. I keep my brand name and all that stuff, right? So should we do it or not? But you know, the, the vision and the risk taking eventually persuaded that PayPal and eBay, that's the parent, to say, okay, let's invest something there and see whether we can get somewhere. It's a small team, by the way. So it's a small team. They started just like a startup, right? So find a bit the product market fit and find spaces. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, 2018, PayPal takes more than 60% of SMB market from 3%. And eBay business was 85, 80%, 85% of the PayPal business. 2018, less than 30%, 13%. And eBay also announced since their separation that PayPal would no longer be the preferred payment provider for eBay. Imagine that this didn't happen. We optimized eBay. Where are we going? Right, so protect your risk, risky allocation on your roadmap. It's really important. By the way, the person leading that uh, is Osama. He later on become the head of the Google wallet payments, and now he's the CEO and the founder of Point. So I'm going to talk a little bit about contentions. Most of the PMs work with other PMs. Actually, more than 80% of the PMs, so one of the survey coming out in a Product Insider in 2019 said 80% of PMs rely on other PMs, other PMs engineering team to work. That means we have to collaborate in the ecosystem, but you also compete. So how do you collaborate with other PMs? Um, you know, if you take any of the negotiation class, you know negotiation is problem solving. Uh, so try to solve the problem in different ways. And one of the things really is, uh, anyone knows the sort of the rocks and the gravel story? Yeah. Okay. So the idea is to put the big things in the bottom first so that you can have little things that room for a small size container to the bottom. So on the left side, the person tries to put in the sand first and then fills up half of its jar and then couldn't have enough space to put the big prior things. So, so if you, you have to put in, in your cup first the priority things, the biggest thing that will make the big impact for you to carry on where you want to go, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so totally. So, uh, so this makes a huge difference. But if we work in our own area, so we actually don't know, but when you work with others, so, uh, so I go back to some of the examples. When you have a different stakeholders and then they look for things that they want to do, you can lock them together. Build something that would be more like a platform versus a one-off, for example, right? So, you know, so how you work with your, uh, your colleague, competitor in terms of resourcing, one of them is really think about that, merge them together. And then, uh, you, know, you know, obviously sequence is one of them as well. Cool. Um, and then I talk a little bit about, you know, more uh, specific things. I'm sure this is an example of the spreadsheets, 
but I put it over here. And when we talk about uh, working with other PMs and competing resources, uh, how do we deal with this? And one of the things is to really have a better visibility on what kind of resourcing needs, what kind of dependencies, and so that you can actually move things around. A lot of times, without good data, without working with the PMs closely, we don't realize that even though they don't have resources, let's say this spread or this quarter, you may just look at it two weeks out. So work with them to see what you can juggle between that will be the most beneficial for everyone else. So this is the example of, you know, you can see a list of uh, uh, features and then how they can, you know, manage different goals, uh, contribute to different goals, and then you can see the competition of the resources. Uh, and then you can work with them, understand if you move things around, can you fit? We call it Tetrisy, but in general, that when you work along that, so try to solve the resourcing problem, I think in the end, it's winning for everyone. Putting it all together, um, so we kind of talked a little bit about the multi-factor evaluation, uh, portfolio approach, and use it more. And this is the same roadmap we showed earlier. So these are the list of features, so we have a score. So we kind of like hide a score, so we show the factors that drove the score. And then we also show, instead of having efforts as a standalone number, we actually look at the different teams, because different teams actually matters. So we realize that if you compare them one by one, you actually don't make the same decision when, as you look at them as a portfolio. You realize, actually, I can move this block of things that would have benefit a bunch of the segments and the metrics to swap for one thing, right? So, so having that visibility, it would help you and your peer PM. So let's say if you're a platform PM, then you would work with a web team. So you guys can solve this problem much, much better. You know, instead of doing this, go find a different way. So get out of your strategy hell, um, Use the best practice of response road mapping. And if you're interested, sign up Dragon Bow will help you to work better with the more visual data, help you to collaborate, help you to see how you allocate your resources and look at your portfolio approach. That's it. Question. Mm. So there are a couple of things that we think about it is that there are lots of tools doing really well for your execution. We decide what to do or execute. You can think about Jira's and Sana's and all that good stuff. What is not doing really well is the big part where really think about what we should do. Deciding on what we should do and deciding on what we should do as a whole portfolio, looking at a different dimensions that matters to you, is today still done by spreadsheets. Uh, so I built a portfolio management for PayPal in 2009. At that time, we had a, a giant tool called the Clarity. PayPal paid $6 million for it. They couldn't make it work, so we paid another $4 million to do professional service. Still couldn't work. So at the end of the day, I built a giant suite of spreadsheets and then we use macros and batches and scripts to make it work, give you some uh, planning optimization. And, and I realized that the biggest impact that we can make is to deciding on the right thing based on you know, external inputs, our resource avail availability. Once we decide what to do, building it, I'm not saying it's easy, but building it is much easier in terms of the convoluted effect because you have a more contained um, set of challenges, right? So building some, designing on what to build versus building it, two different mindset, two different thought process. But this part uh, is where we, we really do very well for Dragon Ball. And it's actually, you can almost think about tool never works until the tool supports some sort of best practices or, or processes. And this tool is built for the best practices and the process of responsive role mapping, which is taking a portfolio view, think about your uh, multi-factor, and then using uh, the more versus ROI to prioritize things. 
How do you plan the breakdowns between the product roadmap? Say you organize the resources, but then the thing you talk going to take less time, takes longer time, so then everything is sequenced, or how would you adjust things? Does the tool help you with that? Or? Yes, yes. So uh, this is also tied to uh, this, this cycle happens. Because like everything, right, it takes twice or three times longer to build and then, you know, something else come up. So, so we, in the execution cycle, we realize it's change that we can feed back to here. And, you know, most of the company, so the today's behavior is that a company does annual planning and then they have a plan somewhere. They do quarterly planning and it goes somewhere. And then they go to sprint planning. That's, that's what actually Bible is, right? The thing is, but if you don't connect them together, now, what's the point of doing all that stuff early on, right? So for us, is you can't think about a quarterly planning, but it's not quarterly happening. It's quarterly in time horizon, but it happens, it's almost like, you know, monthly or bi-weekly. Just like you do agile sprints, teamwork. When you do sprints, you talk about two-week sprints and then maybe four weeks uh, backlog grooming, but you do daily stand-up. Think about this goes higher, and this part of things would adjust back. So you do the rolling, um, longer time horizon of the planning and allocation and, and, and the portfolio side of um, adjustment. Does the tool send a notification to you know, parties who will have a key role like two days before execution date or do you have such a feature in it? Uh, so we have some of them but not all, all of them. The reason is uh, PM is art and science sometimes. Uh, we can send a notification you tell people something for, for something more contextual and people want to understand why things change. It's different where you, a smaller number of things you can change with your team, even that you still have to justify with your team. Imagine you have to explain to your you know, directors or you know, your customer success, whatever person say, hey, we're not going to do that with just a notification. It's much better for you to have a control to say, here's what we're thinking, here's what we decided to do so that you don't get a lot of aspirations, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's as a tool instead of taking your job, right? Right, it's a helper, right? It's, it's a helper for you. So you have the data, you have the facts, you, you have a way to communicate with people. The, the interesting thing is that, why is the product manager's job is so hard? Is that we get stuck in this middle, right? So all the information flows between all the external parties and business and customers to us, and then we flow this to the engineering and the flow out, right? So people say, don't kill the messenger. But in, unfortunately, you know, sometimes we're a little bit like a messenger. So, you know, we need to figure out how to work with different stakeholders in the way and the languages that they are familiar with. How does the tool help for the market inputs? Like, how does the, this uh, fit in the overall picture of the strategy cycle and execution cycle? Yeah, uh, so very good question. Um, I think the key thing is this, where, so if we look at statistically, things coming out of here, <coughs> things come out of here, it's probably like, you know, 80, 90 to, you know, 10, 20. So a lot of the fuzzy stuff, a lot of things you think about, a lot of stuff, if you have it here, stay in a different place. This is important because one is you need some time to noodle on it, you need some time to play around it, and then it also will not clutter and distract your team, right? So that's like that's why we want to have it separately. So you have all this ambiguity, con confusion, negotiation separately. Once you decide that some enough uh, amount, that's how you integrate here. Now I'm not saying you completely do something outside of your engineer. You still are gonna work with your leads. You're probably gonna have someone to work with you, but the majority of the team will not be kind of tackled in here, right? Only at the right time. So it's gonna be less noise, and also you compartmentize things uh, better this way. So the roadmaps come inside the strategy cycle. Right, the beginning of the roadmap. Yes. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit on this uh, portfolio goal? You talk about three steps. Can you explain a little bit more? The, the acquisition, retention, conversion, and retention. Here. This one? No, the, uh, a few slides earlier. The portfolio goal. One more. Yep, I okay. Know. 
Okay. <laughs> so, by the way, this is a very, uh, this is a, nobody think about it before this way. So, uh, so just want to claim that um, it's just how you think about things, not necessarily defined by books or anything. The way, uh, with someone with a finance background, the way I look at a portfolio, I would think about is a basket of things I could do into things, everything that I could be working on and invest in are having their set of characteristics. So once you think about that, you know, think about your retirement portfolio, you will have like a uh, large cap and small cap and you know, real estate. And then, but there's a different view to look at it. So instead of a large cap, you can look at a domestic versus international. There's, there's a different dimension, right? It's a different dimension. So there's, you know, obviously domestic has large cap and stuff. So, and then the same thing for you, when you, in, when you build your roadmap, it has these kind of characteristics. I can look at them and say, hey, as a com as for me, if I'm owning a product, and my product right now is like everyone sign up, but they don't convert. So I don't need to put a lot of uh, resources on acquisition because I don't have sort of the top of funnel problem, I have the conversion problem. But let's say you know you did a lot of work and then you can convert our customers uh, for whatever uh, reason that your retention, especially in the SaaS world, right? So how are they going to stay? Do they stay or they don't stay? The, as you go down the pipe, the new problem gets discovered, right? You open the door, there are five doors. So that is how you decide on your partition. And, and by the way, when, when you use our tool and look at our customers, you can see there's a very interesting lag. They always invest, over invest in the goals that was like the last two quarters. Because they have done that for a while. They're like, I can work on this. I can optimize it. And then they won't go from sort of take one step back look at a bigger picture view, they can start looking at sort of more detail view and opt become the optimization. So having the ability to see the data help us to make better decisions. I have two questions. So the first question is say, uh, so do you um, have uh, any say, like kind of experience say when you start to demo your product to a you know the company, and when you're you know explain your solution, that company say, hey, this is not exactly not what I want. Actually, this is not what I'm expecting. So how you know, how will you handle that situation? Uh, my second question is about for the B two B market. So how do you do the competitor analysis or market research? Uh, because you know for the B two C, so products you can as a user you can register, look at the features understand the flow of the business operations, but for the B2B product, you cannot just say as a individual user or register, right? So mm -hmm. could you uh, share about your experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very good question. So let's give a live demo. So you can tell me if it's something you want or not. Let's see how defensive I am. Uh, <clears throat> so um, again, you know, this, this, this is actually Dragon Ball. This is my uh, real robot. Um, you may tell me this is not exactly what you want, so let's mm. test me how I answer that. Hopefully, I do well. If not, I can learn something. Uh, so, <coughs> so this this is my product, and it has the idea, which is all the PM thinking place, and then we have forecast, which is you're collaborating with your other PM, so also I engineer and lead, and then uh, manage and dashboards more for reporting. And manage, by the way, is for project managers. If some of you guys have like uh, more detailed hands-on management. You can use that, you don't have to. And the dashboard is for reporting. So, <clears throat> so how does this one start is you start with setting up your objectives. Now, we didn't spend a whole lot of time to build the setting up objectives because we think, you know, by the time objective is set, it's fairly fast. So we set up objectives here, and then you can look at all the potential product features that would fulfill these objectives. So they are prioritized within each of the objectives for my entire portfolio. Now, what if I would say, hey, you know, if I look at my uh, different product areas and want to see how they contribute to, um, okay, let me see this. So this is how I construct my roadmap. I'll say, okay, this is my roadmap for PMs, so for you guys. And uh, this is how product managers 
uh, roadmap, PM roadmap contribute to different, um, different goals, objectives. So then I have a general idea saying, hey, is it the right way? Uh, why, why, we, why we have so much user expansion on existing? Why don't we have a lot of the onboarding if that's something more important, right? Immediately expose some sort of the, the problems that I have. So I can look into that. So this is the only objective view. Uh, and this is a little bit of the portfolio as well. So what if we look at a time frame? And the time frame is like you can call it a month, quarter, whatever makes sense to you. And you can see how, um, again, most of stuff in August, not much of stuff in July. Is it true or not true? So like this is the example of me doing a demo. Now, so now you tell me, is this what you're looking for? If it's not what you're looking for, how do I answer that question? Is this what you're looking for? Are you looking for something different? So assume this is not something you look for. Look for something else. And you say, well, you know, you talk about all these allocations, you talk about all these like uh, resource contentions. I don't see that. Where is that? Uh, so, so then I will say, okay, so that's a great, good question. First, always good question. And, and then, uh, okay, so let's look at a little bit of the resource, resourcing. How resourcing come into play? Um, so let's look at this. So here are different time frames, and these are little different set of the products. By the way, it looks very much like spreadsheets because we love spreadsheets, don't we? Um, and then you have all these resource needs in different areas. Some of them, let's say I have this team, I have the web team. I don't really own, for example, the consulting team. And uh, if I need their resources, or if I need uh, other teams, I can see how the demand coming through. So I, this is where I, I solve problems with my other PM partners. I need your, I need your resources. Uh, can, we, can we work on this, right? So this is like, how do you say, what well, can we move, can we adjust? And, and that's your 10 is like a four, five spreadsheets you wanna put it in one place, and then you can adjust to that. But still, it's not what I'm looking for. Where's the allocation? Okay, sorry, I'm moving too slow. So let me show you the allocation. Now you have all this, you, now you have all the, all the estimates. Now the timeline coming together. So there are two ways of looking at allocation. Mm -hmm. One is you can see how we, uh, what kind of projects we're working on in different goals. And you can see there are different pro uh, roadmaps. Imagine each roadmap is on one by 1 p.m. And in this case, you see everyone has the resources. So what if we don't? What if we don't have enough resources? That's where you can negotiate on uh, how we move things around. Can I delete, that, delete this? Which one should I delete? Which one's more important? Um, we can also, finally, we come to allocation. So <clears throat> in here, we're allocating by objectives, for example. And for a certain time frame, and we can see that we're not, we're under allocating some of the stuff for cool factors, but we actually over allocated for some of the things, uh, user expansion and onboarding. And this is, should we invest more in this? Should we have more cool factor? That's the conversation we can have because we're thinking about our stuff as a portfolio. So um, now going back to answer your question. When people, when you do a demo with the people, they say, this is what we look for. It is very hard to understand what people look for until we really know bottom down what that problem is. So you know, understand that problem is more helpful uh, in that because I almost never done a demo that people say this is exactly what I look for. It's not that it's not in your product, it's how you show it so they understand because you know your product so well, they don't. So that's one. And then uh, I think your second question is how do you get more B two B customers. B two B customer like competitor analysis and market research. Yeah, competitor. Yeah. So um, competitive research and the market. Uh, a couple of things that we did in the past, I think it has been very successful. Is that it's a joint effort. So one is if your sales people on the field are talking to the customer all the time, they obviously run into competitors all the time. So you start usually you start to have some sort of a space in your you know, internal, you know, wiki or whatnot, right? So you have this competitor space so that people ask questions about competitors and when you start to create a battle cards or whatnot, then you can put the information over there. 
you can subscribe some of the, you know, obviously the endless research and things like that. And um, then, uh, you know, I personally feel like whenever you go, so there obviously there's a Capoterra and a G2 is that well. And, and the, the challenge is that that place becomes so noisy, it's not very helpful. You know, every category you go, there are like 300 things. It's not really helpful anymore. But through interaction with their customers, through your customer success team, when people churn, uh, when the salespeople talking to who they are going to compete against, these are the good sources because, you know, like you said, a B2B customer tend to be more high touch. Mm -hmm. So understand their challenges and then taking input as much as you can to start to build the profiles of competitors. Uh, it will be very helpful. One of the companies, my last company, Fizai, is in a, a fraud, AI for fraud prevention. So when we look at the landscape of that, it's like, you know, literally hundreds and then more and more coming to place. People realize, hey, there's a lot of money to be made. Everyone's coming to this space. So we had to create something like, you know, categorize it, put a user, uh, basic user journey, and then see each of the competitors where they go, and then take your sales and the customer success input to put your competitor in different categories so you have a better way to demo. Under the thing is, uh, everyone, certain aspects of the product are more appealing to some kind of customer. So once you start to put your competitor in the lens of the customer journey and or job to be done, then you can resonate them better in your demo, in your sales process. Thank you. Sure. Yeah.